Kirby and the Forgotten Lands is the latest in the mainline Kirby series. A follow-up to 2018's Star Allies, Kirby and the Forgotten Lands is the second mainline Kirby game for the Switch and the first fully 3D platformer Kirby game, which is honestly crazy considering Kirby made his debut all the way back in 1992 for the original Game Boy. It took Kirby 30 years to make the jump to full 3D, way after other classic platformers. But was this transition successful? If you don't know by now, I'm a really big Kirby fan. It's up there with Mega Man, Doom, and Kingdom Hearts for my all-time favorite game franchise. I've played every mainline Kirby game aside from Squeak Squad and The Amazing Mirror, and I main DDD and Smash, so I always get excited when a new Kirby game is coming out, and this was no exception. I was really excited for The Forgotten Lands. The trailers did a really good job hyping me up. I was especially excited to see how the transition to 3D would play out. As a quick aside, I do find it kind of weird how many people and news sites initially called this game an open world game, because it is an open world at all. And honestly, I'm very thankful for that because I don't think an open world Kirby game would be very fun. The Forgotten Lands is graphically really impressive. The game of course has a cartoony aesthetic versus a real one, but you can really see a lot of detail in the design of some things. The environments are extremely detailed. Kirby's hats have a lot of detail put into them. You see all these individual stitchings and things. The game runs great too, I never experienced any frame divs or performance issues, though things in the background do run at a lower frame rate than things in the foreground. You can especially tell with enemies moving in the background. It's not something that really bothered me or really impacted my gameplay experience at all, but you can tell if they had to cut back the frames on things going on in the background to ensure that what was going on directly on screen wasn't affected. The music was all really good, the vast majority of it was brand new, it all fit the theme and tone of the game very well and fit the Kirby universe very well. It is a little interesting that none of the fan favorite franchise running music really makes a return outside of King Dedede's theme, which King Dedede's theme is my favorite theme in all of Kirby so that was pretty cool, but it was just kind of interesting to see that none of the other motifs really make a return. Like with most Kirby games, the story isn't exactly the deepest. Kirby and the Waddle Dees are teleported to a mysterious new world, and the Waddle Dees are being attacked and caged by these furry animals in this new world. Kirby is tasked with saving them. All of the charm and cuteness expected of a Kirby game is here and accounted for. I honestly feel kind of bad killing the enemies sometimes, because they look so cute and happy just chilling and minding their own business. But if Kirby says that you must die, then you must die. I really can't overstate just how charming this game is. I had such a stupid happy face throughout the entire opening of this game, especially in the opening cutscene where Kirby turns into a car. It just fills me with joy and I found it very endearing. The overall aesthetic is actually kind of different from other Kirby games. The game has this sort of post-apocalyptic abandoned city feel to it. Something really different from the usual abstract dreamlike levels and worlds of the other Kirby games. It has a more grounded, almost realistic aesthetic, at least in the environments, which provides a unique contrast for a Kirby game. The lighthearted nature of Kirby and the simpler gameplay make the almost bleak level environments stick out that much more. Like you're flying around, eating cute enemies, and hunting for cake all inside of an abandoned mall straight out of a zombie movie. The level design is still varied and interesting, with several different biomes to explore. You have the mentioned abandoned malls, but you also have tropical beaches, snow-covered city streets, run-down carnivals, and polluted deserts. Many classic enemies return, but the majority of the enemies are new, all some sort of animal or animal-themed enemy. The new bosses fit this animal motif, including Goromondo, a huge gorilla, Clawreline, total furry bait, Silly Dillo, a crazy doll obsessed armadillo, and Leongar, a big lion. Some classic bosses return as well, though they underwent some redesign. For example, the Kirby staple Wispy Woods, which has had a variant in every Kirby game, appears as Tropic Woods, a palm tree instead of the usual forest tree. He drops coconuts instead of apples. The most, I don't know, I like guess strange redesign was for King Dedede though. He's just this oval shaped blob in this game with no defined neck or anything. It's actually a throwback to how he looked in the N64, Kirby and the Crystal Shards, which is pretty cool and I kinda like it, but I also just think it's a weird design. He is studly though. There's actually an abundance of references to past Kirby games throughout the Forgotten Lands, and I enjoyed finding all the references and easter eggs. One I particularly liked was the needle abilities that look like the double needle power from Kirby 64. As I said at the beginning, this game is not open world. 
Not at all. I don't know where people got that idea as it was coming out, but whatever. There are several worlds, each filled with five levels, one being a boss level, and several challenge stages. I liked pretty much every level, no two levels really felt the same. There are good platforming sections and combat challenges, and a plethora of secret areas to find and explore. I was really surprised just how complex some of these secret areas got. I don't want to give too much away, but the most extravagant was on the level Battle of the Bridge, which had a secret area off to the side of the level under some rubble. There was a hidden maximum tomato which is tied to a level specific challenge. From there, there's another hidden ledge leading up to some coins, but that hidden path extends further, revealing a hidden ladder leading you up to a walkway through a building. The walkway leads you to a treasure chest with an unlockable collectible. From there, you can jump back down to the beginning of the level. Or you can go through this open window, which leads you to a room with a warp star that brings you to a harder version of the entire level. It's actually insane. Every level has hidden areas to find and explore, some result in discovering secret collectibles or completing level challenges, and some are just there to find. But they definitely provide the player with incentive to look through all of the levels. At first glance, the gameplay looks very similar to classic 2D Kirby games, just in a full 3D environment. But the Forgotten Land actually adds some new mechanics and changes up some traditional Kirby mechanics to feel new and unique, and actually really challenging at times. Despite how much I love the series, Kirby games have always been on the easier and more basic side for me. I enjoy them for their charm, level design, and pure simplistic fun more so than any deep, engaging mechanics or combat challenges. And while I wouldn't say the Forgotten Land swings very far in the other direction, it's definitely more mechanics driven than some other Kirby games, and there's definitely good challenge for people who want it. Though there are two difficulty options that you can pick from at the beginning of the game. I didn't play on the easier difficulty at all, but it seems like enemies do less damage to Kirby at the expense of earning less coins for completing levels and challenges. So let's get into the gameplay mechanics. First off, Kirby's flight ability is a bit different. Instead of being able to fly to the top of the screen, Kirby has an altitude limit. This is of course to prevent you from going out of bounds in a 3D environment. Kirby also can't fly indefinitely. After a period of time, he gets tired and must spit out the air as he returns to the ground. Because of this, you can't just fly over environmental hazards and enemies. You actually need to fight the enemies and engage with the level hazards and platforming. I like this change. It forces you to engage with the game more and prevents you from just flying around everywhere. You have to navigate intense winds, avoid rolling boulders, dodge falling lava rocks, swim in whirlpool-filled waters, and jump to platforms. The best platforming and environmental challenges are those that require you to utilize the new mouthful mode. Mouthful mode sees Kirby eating a large object which he can't swallow, which allows him to use a new movement-based ability. These include a cone, which gives Kirby the ability to break open cracks on the ground, a car, which lets Kirby plow through enemies and rocks, a glider, which Kirby must navigate a flying section, a fan, which lets Kirby control fans and act as a propeller in a boat, a light bulb, which illuminates dark areas, a pipe, which has Kirby rolling and jumping down a hill, a roller coaster, which has Kirby dodging hazards to pick up objects and hit switches along a track, Stairs, which has Kirby reposition platforms to climb higher in levels. Water Balloon, which has Kirby cleaning dirty areas by spraying water from his mouth. Vending Machine, which shoots cans out to destroy environmental blockades. A Lift, which raises Kirby to get collectibles and get to new locations. And a Dome and File Cabinet, which just has Kirby moving to reveal collectibles or hidden areas. I found all of these mouthful abilities fun to use. Almost every Kirby game has had a gimmick. Kirby's Adventure introduced the copy ability. Kirby's Dream Land 2 and 3 had rideable animals, both which gave the player new ways to fight and explore the levels. Kirby's Return to Dream Land added super abilities, basically just bigger versions of different copy abilities used to pass specific hazards. Triple Deluxe added the Hypernova, which also basically just acted as a momentary power-up to get past specific hazards. Planet Robobot added the Mech, which I really liked, but it was basically just a more powerful version of whatever copy ability Kirby was using. And Star Allies added the Friend Action, which was more interactive than the super abilities in Hypernova, but were still ultimately just momentary power-ups used to get past specific hazards. Out of all of these, besides obviously the copy ability and probably the mech because I did really love the mech, Big Mouth Mode is easily my favorite. It's the most interactive, giving you complete control while using these abilities. They're mostly used to complete certain challenges or break hazards, but they're also more prominent throughout the entire level. And the abilities are uniquely different from one another, mechanically functioning differently, allowing for more engaging and complex platforming and puzzle solving. 
One example I really liked is in the alien funhouse level. There's a part that's all dark, so you need to use the light bulb to light your path and also power these generators to get platforms to move. You have to avoid flashing your light in front of these gordos that are sensitive to light and will follow you around. It's a unique section that really sticks out not only because of the light bulb ability, but because the alien funhouse is a unique location to Kirby as well, and mixing both together just creates a really fun and memorable experience. The best Big Mouth mode moments are towards the end of the game though, where you have to switch back and forth between different abilities to get through a level. There are a couple levels towards the end that are completely built around Big Mouth abilities, and it really highlights just how creative the use of the abilities can be. The devs really did get the most out of these new mechanics. Combat is also enhanced in this game. In most Kirby games, combat comes down to either swallow a thing and spit it out to do damage, or eat the thing, get the power, and press the attack button to use the power. It's not very deep. Sure, certain powers can be used in different situations or against certain enemies or bosses, but there really isn't much to the combat in Kirby games. The Forgotten Lands changes that. First off, the powers have multiple uses. They're not just stuck to one move. Most have a couple moves that you can pull off depending on if you're standing or moving or in the air or holding the attack button instead of pressing it. For example, the fan favorite sword. You can press the attack button for a simple slash, mash it for a flurry of slashes, or hold it for a spinning attack. Certain moves have lasting effects, too. For example, the fire ability will eventually light an enemy on fire, doing continuous damage until it's extinguished. Or the ice ability will eventually freeze an enemy, slowing down their movement until they get stuck in one place, and doing huge damage once the ice breaks. All this just gives more options when it comes to combat, and brings out some much needed depth to Kirby's traditionally basic combat experience. You can also block and dodge roll. Timing a dodge roll perfectly actually causes a momentary slowdown akin to Witch Time from Bayonetta, giving you a chance to get some extra hits in. Blocking and dodge rolling are the best ways to avoid taking damage, especially during boss encounters. I found the bosses in general really well designed. They require you to learn movements and pay attention, especially if you're trying to complete them without taking any damage or in the time limit for the Waddle Dee challenges. One of my favorites is the Silly Dillo boss fight, where he rolls all over the place. It really requires you to time dodge rolls efficiently to maximize your damage output and minimize the damage done to yourself. Learning how and when to block and dodge can be a very valuable combat tool in this game. Every power can also be upgraded. Each upgrade slightly changes the functionality of the power, but also changes its stats like attack speed and damage output. Some abilities can be upgraded multiple times, allowing for more and more powerful abilities. Some are subtle, like Tornado, just kind of gives you more damage output and increases the size of your Tornado Storm. But others are vastly different, like the gun power, which changes from a rifle to two fast shooting pistols to a powerful laser. You can always revert back to a lesser power if you want, but I really didn't see the point. You need to find these upgrade gems by completing treasure roads, challenge levels centered around a specific mechanic. You then use the upgrade gems to purchase upgrades. I like that there is in-game incentive to complete these challenges. Unlocking these upgrades does feel very rewarding, and the upgrades themselves are very fun to use. I looked forward to seeing how the new upgraded power functioned, but at the end of the day, the upgrades are all just the same power. They might vary slightly in how they function, but fire is essentially the same as volcano fire, which is essentially the same as dragon fire. And since the upgraded versions of the power is objectively better than the one that came before it, there is no reason to ever revert back. And there aren't any strategic reasons to be switching back either. There are some power specific challenges in side levels, but they automatically give you the power needed and you can only use that power while completing the challenge level. So you'll never need to think about what power version you are equipping. Just equip the latest one that you unlocked. It really would have been cool to see certain enemies weaker to Volcano Fire versus Dragon Fire, giving you a reason to kind of switch back and forth and plan ahead for which ability loadout you'd want for a given level. This also leads to another negative I have, well, sort of two negatives, but they're directly related. Many mainstay enemies don't return in this game. As a result, many mainstay powers also do not return. There's no Waddle Doos. No Waddle Doos. So that means no beam power either. There's no wheelie, no laser, no mic, no spark, no throw, no stone, no UFO, no parasol. I like the new abilities, and again, I like upgrading these abilities, but the upgraded abilities are basically the same as the version that came before it. As a result, it feels like the Forgotten Lands has a much smaller pool of copy abilities than usual. Kirby's Adventure, the first game to feature copy abilities, had 25 copy abilities, 
Planet Robobot had 27, and Star Allies had 28. In comparison, The Forgotten Lands has 12. I understand that the upgrades were intended to take up slots for the copy abilities, but having four different swords that essentially function identically to one another does not make up for a significantly different ability like Spark, Stone, Whip, or Beetle not returning. I'd love to see these upgrade system return, 100%. I liked unlocking new abilities and having incentive to complete challenges, but I hope more powers are available in the future as well. While I'm on mixed feelings, now would be a good time to bring up the multiplayer. The Forgotten Land is two player. Player two plays as Bandana D, exclusively. This game is really fun two player, and it's definitely a plus being able to play with a friend, but playing as player two can get a bit, I don't know, tedious after a while. It sucks not being able to change your moveset or use the big mouth abilities, or even upgrade your moveset. You're just stuck with the same handful of spear moves the entire game. The best Kirby multiplayer experiences are in Superstar or Dreamland 3 or even Star Allies, where player 2 has access to every copy ability just like Kirby does. Even Return to Dreamland let player 2 pick between Bandana D, Meta Knight, or King Deity, giving three different movesets to play in case you got bored with one of them. I understand for story reasons why Meta Knight or DDD weren't available, but maybe bringing a character like Gooey back would have been nice to give player two some variation. That said, Bandanity is fun for what he is. He uses his signature spear and has his own moveset. You can stab in a flurry, fly like a helicopter and rain spears down, slide attack, and even throw spears. He is fun to play. He just isn't as fun compared to Kirby when Kirby can use all these different moves all the time. Also, the camera is a little wonky for player two. Most of the time it's not an issue because it's a fixed perspective, but in boss fights especially when the camera's following Kirby, Waddle Dee's just kind of off in the background doing his own thing and he's easy to get lost. One of the things that surprised me was just how big this game is. There is a lot to do in it. There are 24 levels and 7 bosses in the main campaign, 57 treasure road challenge levels, 6 additional challenging remix story missions that continue the story, including harder bosses, there's a collectathon element where you have to collect Waddle Dees to grow Waddle Dee Town, the game's central hub, there are 300 Waddle Dees to find. These Waddle Dees are hidden throughout levels and are earned by completing level challenges. As the town grows, you get access to things like shops, Kirby's house, and minigames. These minigames include fishing, working at a restaurant, and a rolling game. The rolling game is so fucking difficult and frustrating, I just couldn't get the hang of it. It reminds me a bit of Kirby's Tilt and Tumble with the motion controls, but it was really hard. I didn't even bother doing the harder timed version of it. The shops are pretty useful. One gives health items, another gives buffs that can stack a number of times. These buffs are timed improvements to Kirby's strength and agility, or a second health bar which disappears after it depletes. They're very useful for getting past tough spots, running through levels quicker, and beating bosses easier. You can also carry items with you into the levels for later use. Maxing out your strength and speed, giving yourself a second health bar, and then carrying a maximum tomato into a stage with you pretty much ensures an easy victory no matter what level you're going into. You also get access to a coliseum with two different arenas. Lastly, there are 256 gacha figurines to unlock by either finding them in levels or buying them in gacha machines. It's just crazy how much content is in this game. The Waddle Dee challenges and Treasure Roads actually stick out for being quite tough for a Kirby game. The Waddle Dee challenges differ from level to level. They can be something simple like completing the level, but also something much harder like finding hidden areas, defeating a boss with a specific ability, or completing sections of a level or a boss without taking any damage. The one for defeating the bosses without taking damage are especially challenging. They really require you to pay attention and learn an enemy's attack pattern. Though you can cheese these a bit as well, player 2 can take damage and still have the challenge count. So if you want, you can have your Waddle D friend kill the boss while you run away and block. Couple this with a shield from a fully upgraded ice ability where you're invincible, no damage can break that shield. You aren't shown what challenges you need to complete, with one hint given to you every time you complete the level. Because of how hidden, specific, or cryptic some of these Waddle D challenges can be, you'll find yourself replaying levels several times as you get them all and you need to complete the entire level too. You can't just get the Waddle Dee and quit out. You need to get to the end for it to count, and this can get very tedious after a while. The Treasure Roads are extra missions that award you an upgrade gem. Each challenge is centered around a specific mechanic, whether it's a specific copy ability or big mouth ability. For the most part, the completing the missions aren't too difficult. Some require some thinking and planning, like the stairs one or the cutter ones, but the challenge really comes in in trying to complete these in par. 
They are ruthless with how spot on you need to be, and you need to be nearly perfect. There's no recovering if you fumble, but honestly, like the tilting minigame, there really isn't much incentive to complete these challenges in par. You just get some coins, which you can get from playing the levels. And since, like I mentioned, you'll be replaying levels several times, you're never really going to be short on coins. So it really wasn't worth it to me to complete these on par, and I just stopped trying after a while. I'm going to be talking about the ending here for a second, so if you don't want any spoilers involving the final boss or the ending, skip to the time code provided. All right. So in typical Kirby fashion, eventually this shit hits the fan, and this happy cute game blows up with a world ending threat. As the game goes on, Kirby's new friend Elephant is captured. Kirby goes to rescue him and eventually finds a mysterious factory. The remnants of a past society, now gone, is actually kind of somber and disturbing for a Kirby game. You face off against Leongar, which is a good boss fight. But then after that, the real final boss makes his appearance. Fecto Forgo, this blobby mass of horrors. He chases you throughout a lab as you try to escape. After defeating Fecto Forgo, he fuses with Ethelin to create Fecto Ethelis. At this point, I was like, this is a Sonic villain. He has multiple forms, he's this alien ultimate life form, he's a humanoid, furry, animal looking thing, he looks like he's from Sonic, his name is Fecto Ethelis, he's a Sonic villain. Anyways, the boss fight is actually awesome. It's challenging, it has a lot of moves to learn, he's fast so you need to be quick too, it's full of spectacle, but it's still really engaging, one of the best boss fights from a Kirby game. After you defeat him, he starts destroying the planet, and Planet Popstar is revealed, and he summons this giant meteor, and Kirby eats a fucking semi-truck, and you're driving on falling buildings as the world around you is falling apart and you're driving to meet him. It's absolutely insane in the best way possible. I loved how insane it was, and I had a stupid smile on my face the entire time. I love how insane Kirby games get at the end in general. It was such a grandiose, epic conclusion that seemingly came out of nowhere, but was really executed very well. And I just loved seeing Semi-Truck Kirby. It was fucking awesome. Once you defeat him, the credits roll, and there's a brief post credit scene showing Leongar still possessed by Fecto. So from there, you unlock harder remixed levels with harder versions of the bosses. You have a new collectible to get this part, Leon's Soul. Getting all of them unlocks a new boss fight, Morpho Knight, basically a harder Meta Knight. This fight is really intense. He's fast, he has fire attacks, and psychic attacks that confuse you. Defeating him rewards you with an upgraded sword ability and also the true game's main ending. But it doesn't stop there. The real final boss is at the end of the second Colosseum level, and that being Chaos Ephelus, a harder, more intense version of the final boss. And this fight is also really well done. As good as the first Fecto Ephelus fight is, the Chaos Ephelus fight is that much better. After you defeat him, you get one final brief cutscene concluding the game. Kirby and the Forgotten Land is a huge success for Kirby's transition into 3D. It wasn't perfect, and there are some things that I hope they expand upon and improve upon for future entries, but this game was really fun, and I enjoyed it a lot. It's definitely worth giving the Forgotten Lands a playthrough. I know this video is super late, Kirby and the Forgotten Lands has been out for a while, but I appreciate you watching, I hope you liked the video. Please leave a comment or subscribe, it helps the channel a lot, and we'll see you next time.